happy time and the carefree time. A time of auto rides and double dates. It's a time of fun, of pranks and jokes, of ice cream cones and chocolate sodas. Youth is a time for getting a job, for finding one's place in the world. But sometimes in these troubled days, the very thoughtlessness of youth has led to a living nightmare. Addiction to drugs, too often acquired with tragic carelessness, may take control of a life and force actions not dreamed of before. To these addicts, life's only work is to find money for drugs. In their desperation, no means is too foul. Their only goal in life is to keep the deadening chemicals forever in their heart's blood. The cause of this living death is a white powder, innocent looking, but deadly. Once this was a poppy growing in Italy or Turkey or some other hot land. The dried juice of this plant produces opium, a powerful drug. Contained in opium is morphine, used by doctors to relieve severe pain. From morphine comes heroin, outlawed even medically from the United States. These and other derivatives form the group of drugs called opiates. Opiates are classed as depressants. An overdose causes unconsciousness, then death. A smaller dose, taken into the bloodstream, inhibits all the functions of the body by its action on the brain and the central nervous system. But the body gradually builds up a tolerance to the drug. More and more is needed to produce the same effects. After continued use, the body acquires a physical dependence on opiates so that withdrawal of the drug causes a brief but violent illness until the body can make a readjustment. Another depressant is marijuana, derived from the hemp plant. It inhibits and distorts the action of the brain and nervous system in a manner somewhat different from opiates. A third drug, cocaine, is derived from the leaves of the coca plant. Its action is different from that of the depressants. When cocaine enters the body, it has a strong effect on body functions by acting as an int on the brain. Cocaine causes unusual and often unpredictable feelings and actions. Instead of physical dependence, marijuana and cocaine cause profound mental and emotional disturbances. A large overdose of cocaine causes convulsions then death. Government agencies charged with the enforcement of narcotics laws have been able until recently to decrease steadily the number of addicts in the United States. These addicts have included persons in every walk of life. Some are petty criminals who will remain drug addicts all their lives. Many addicts come from teeming slum areas where human misery runs high. But the grim specters of heroin, marijuana, and cocaine are not confined to any area or to any group. Wherever there is a troubled personality, no matter how hidden or unrecognized, there may be a seedbed for drug addiction. So unpredictable is this habit that occasionally even one who knows the dangers may become addicted before he realizes it. Sometimes the addict may come from a wealthy family, for drugs respect neither riches nor poverty. Such a victim doesn't have to steal to support his expensive habit, but the degrading effects are the same. In recent years, there has been a shocking increase in drug addiction among young people, often in their teens, who take up the habit without the slightest understanding of the living nightmare they are so unthinkingly walking into. To get the illegal drugs, they are forced to deal with criminals 
who prey on those least able to defend themselves. And to find money for their expensive habit, they often turn to crime themselves. under his foot and I found this envelope with six caps in it. Here's a chemical lab report on it. It's heroin. What do you have to say, Demelon? Let's see your arms. How long have you been taking heroin? Well, I... Speak up. About two years, I guess. What about before then? Smoked marijuana for a while. How long? Four or five months, I guess. How did you get started on this? Well, I don't know. A friend of mine, well, he started me. Started by a friend. An oft-told story. For drug addiction is contagious. One addict can make five. Five can make 25. Marty's story is like many of the others. It started two years ago with marijuana cigarettes. Come on, it's my turn next. Gee, Duke, where'd you get them? Uh, I, uh, I know a guy. Three for a buck. Let me try. Gee. I, I feel awful funny. Me too. <laughs> I feel kind of sick. Uh, come on, Marty, pass it on. Marty got kind of sick too, but he wouldn't let on. He was determined to be one of the gang if it killed him. And it almost did. Several weeks later, after smoking reefers, Marty's befogged brain hit on a clever way to open pop bottles. Later, Stan went to the hospital for swallowing broken glass. Marty badly cut the inside of his mouth, though he didn't even know it at the time. Duke was the one who got Marty on the habit. It was just a business matter to Duke, though Marty didn't find it out till later. Hey, Marty. Here. Look at here. What's that? H. H? What's H? That's a lot. It's heroin. Will it make me sick like the reefers did? I'm going to try it. I dare you. How much does it cost? This one ain't gonna cost you nothing. It's free. Go on. I dare you. In his ignorance, Marty took that dare, little knowing the eventual horror that lay in the deadly white powder. Those first capsules were free. But when Marty started asking for them, the price came high, a dollar and a half a piece. That's right, kid. Fifteen bucks. This ought to hold me for a while. I hocked my camera to get this, though. Where's my cut? You don't get one. This kid's hooked. Go out and get some new kids if you want to cut. Well, he's still snorting it. So what? Snorting or mainlining? What's the difference? He's hooked. Hey, look, look, I, I, I gotta have my cut. It, it's costing me more than ever now that I'm on speedballs. That cocaine comes high. That's your problem, kid. So, you're snorting it, huh? Yeah. Well, don't be a sucker. You're wasting it that way. Use a needle. Is that what you do, Louie? Listen, kid, I ain't on the stuff. Don't ever think I am. Yeah, sure. Like I'm doing it, see? Mainlining it. Don't it hurt? Yeah, sure, some. I guess that vein will give out someday. But the stuff costs too much to waste it. That's right, kid. You ought to go on the needle. Nah, I don't want to punch myself full of holes like that. But he did use the needle, despite his fear of it. At first he shot the drug under his skin, then directly into the vein. As his body gradually built up a tolerance, he needed more and more of the drug. There was no pleasure in it for Marty. It was a bodily demand. He was using four or five caps a day now, 
they cost him seven and a half dollars, fifty-two fifty a week. It was more than his salary at the store could pay for. But he was wrong. Barston didn't prosecute, but Marty no longer had a job. Drugs were becoming Marty's whole life. He was abnormally sleepy, losing weight, cross, irritable, fearful that the puncture marks on his arms would be discovered. His former friends now let him strictly alone. But with a false sense of loyalty, they didn't report him to the authorities. They would have done him a favor if they had. The only associates left for Marty were other drug addicts like Duke. It didn't matter. Nothing mattered but the ever-present craving for the drugs. He had given up interest in everything else. Marty's family saw all of these symptoms and others too, but didn't understand them. Often in the morning, his pillow would be wet from perspiration. His mother knew something was wrong. Something. Marty, have you seen the pinking shears I bought last week? Can't seem to find them anywhere. How should I know, Ma? Marty, you don't seem right, son. I'm worried about you. I'm all right, Mom. Just leave me alone. There's something wrong. I'm going to take you down to Dr. Bleeker's this afternoon for a checkup. No. No, I'm all right. Well, you don't act like it, son. I don't know what it could be. Ever since you lost that job at Mr. Boston. I don't know. I'm all right, Mom. I'll snap out of it. I hope so. You've lost weight. You don't have dates. You don't go out with the fellas anymore like you used to. There's something wrong. I know there must be. Well, boys go through all kinds of stages. Dr. Bleeker can tell us if there's anything wrong. I hope it isn't anything serious. Marty! Marty! Marty was hooked, physically dependent on heroin. When he was without white powder too long, his whole body revolted in dreadful protest. Sweat poured from him. He got the shakes. He had cold chills. His nose ran and his eyes ran. He was doubled up by piercing cramps, plagued by sudden attacks of vomiting and of diarrhea. Nothing could stop these attacks, but more of the white drug in his veins. All right, kid. Beat it. I don't want you hanging around here. Okay, okay. Give me a chance. Heading it tough, huh? None of your business. Okay. That's the way you feel about it? I was just trying to help you out, that's all. Yeah. You wouldn't help your mother out of a rat hole. How would you like to make a fast couple of bucks? Doing what? Oh, it's easy. Nothing to it. I could use some new customers. Customers? You mean suckers. I'll give you the same cut I gave Duke. What happened to him? Oh, he's brought in everybody he knows. I gotta branch out. Well, I... I could use the dough at that. Fine. Shut him out on reefers. It's easier that way, and it's cheaper. Yeah, that's the way I started. You got him? Sure. For you, two bits a piece. Well, give me two for now. That's all the dough I got. Right now. So, Marty went out to spread his contagion. And Louie? Well, it was just business to him. The capsules of heroin, so necessary to Marty, were only so much stock to Louie. That stock had reached him through a series of well-organized underworld transactions. Some months back, smuggled ashore in a box of fresh-caught fish, were a number of small tubes of pure heroin, a kilogram in all, a little more than two pounds. Originally bought for $1,000, it was resold after being smuggled into this country for $7,000. It was mixed with a similar looking white powder, milk sugar, and sold again for $30,000. These were big business transactions possible only by organized criminal syndicates. Many believe such syndicates in a cold-blooded scheme to create a market for their drugs are directly responsible for the sudden growth of drug addiction among young people. By the time Louis Legty got it, the heroin had been cut many times, passed through many hands. 
he cut it again and put it up in capsules. There was less than 3% heroin in those capsules. The underworld made more than a quarter of a million dollars on the original $1,000 investment. Big stakes, worth taking a few chances for, especially when Pusher Louie would take the rap. But even Louie wasn't taking much of a chance. He had junkies, dope addicts working for him, like Marty Demelon. Marty had to keep going somehow to bring in the daily flow of money necessary to keep his habits supplied with drugs. When there were no new customers for Louis, Marty worked at any job he could find. But the jobs didn't last long. Often he had to turn to petty thieving and shoplifting to get the money he so desperately needed. Before long, he became fairly well known to the police. Mrs. Demelon, do you have anything to say? Yes, Judge. Marty, he isn't a bad boy. I wish you could have seen him before he started this poison. He always made good grades at school. He was doing so well at Mr. Barston's grocery. Judge, he's a good boy. I understand. Demelon? I believe you acquired the drug habit through ignorance. If you knew then what you know now, you probably never would have touched that first marijuana cigarette. Well, there's no way of undoing it now. I'm going to sentence you to one year in the municipal jail. However, I'll suspend sentence if you're willing to be committed to a hospital for the treatment of drug addicts and stay there until medically discharged. You mean to try to kick the habit? That's right. They know how to get you over the physical dependence with the least amount of withdrawal sickness. Do you agree? Yes, sir. All right, so ordered. Next case. For those already addicted to drugs, the first step in rehabilitation must be commitment to a hospital where they will be under medical guidance. For the addict willing to be committed or sent by the courts, there are federally operated hospitals. Adequate local hospitals would help to cope with this problem. The treatment itself lasts for months, but withdrawing the drug, the major problem is helping the addict achieve a workable psychological adjustment to life, a life which doesn't include drugs. It's a difficult procedure. No hospital, no doctor can be sure of success in trying to change long-time attitudes. Back in his old haunts, the former addict still finds himself shunned by all but the addicts and peddlers who were his associates before. For effective treatment, there must be a long-term, community-wide program to help the former addict and his family make an adjustment. Be it, Duke. I want no part of you. Ah, don't be a square. What's it getting you? I don't know yet, Duke. I took plenty to kick the habit. It's my chance, and I'm taking it. A chance? <laughs> you ain't got no chance. They're just a junkie to everybody around here. I know, I know. But they helped me get a job in here. And they went to see Ma. And the doc says that if Doc I... says, what does he know? Listen, I'm telling you... No, I'll cut it. Against such pressures, local outpatient clinics, social agencies, the church, all are needed if drug addicts are to adjust to a new life. Without intensive effort by all community forces, very few drug addicts can ever expect to return to a normal, useful life in society. It is important in the overall problem of drug addiction to do everything possible to stop the sale of the drugs. One step would be to increase the staff of enforcement agencies, not only federal, but state and municipal agencies too. Criminal syndicates might give up drug traffic entirely if nationwide laws provided for stringent penalties to counteract the tremendous profits, and if these laws were energetically enforced. Certainly such laws would restrict the actions of non-addict peddlers like Louis Legte and make it harder for him to reach his victims. Basic to everything else is a wider knowledge especially among young people, of the grave danger involved in any kind of experimentation with drugs. They should understand the thoughtless curiosity about what it feels like to smoke marijuana or take a shot of heroin can lead to a lifetime of pain and torment, constantly faced by the horror of being without drugs. Much can be done to stamp out this vicious 
if each person who knows of a drug peddler or a drug addict reports him to the authorities immediately as a deadly menace to himself and his friends. For every person must take some of the responsibility for preventing the growth of drug addiction. He must face the possibility that he himself may be a potential drug addict. Only by avoiding these drugs completely can he be sure that he will remain forever safe from a vicious habit which enslaves not only one's body, but the soul as well.